Welcome back to On the Move with Victor Shi. Today is Tuesday, March 7th. Um, and over the weekend, we saw the Republican Party on full display during their CPAC conference in Washington, D.C. Donald Trump appeared more unhinged and crazy than ever before. Other speakers like Michael Knows, who I mentioned yesterday, literally called for the eradication of transgenderism. And we also saw numerous other Republican speakers show just how extreme and low this party has become. We've saw, we saw people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, other people speak about this Republican party. And Luckily, I am joined by someone who I didn't ever imagine I would talk to uh, <laughs> during our political moment. We are, I am fortunate and I'm grateful to know uh, Michael Steele, who, of course, is the former chair of the RNC and lieutenant governor of Maryland. And he's now an MSNBC political analyst who helps us make sense of how this Republican Party has become so crazy. Um, he is just a, an amazing voice, and I'm grateful to call Michael a friend. Thank you so much for being here, Michael. Hey, Victor. Good to be with you, man. How's it going? It's good. I'm currently in L.A., so we're separated uh, literally across the country, but um, I, I, it's glad to see you virtually. Very good. Yeah, no, enjoy L.A. Uh, you know, <laughs> they got more snow out on your end of the world than we've had on ours. So I know. I don't know. It's a little topsy-turvy. You know, I don't know why people just kind of overplay this, uh, you know, environmental stuff. You know, global warming is not a thing, people. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can definitely talk about cheek. <laughs> no, it was revolting I, I had a friend in dc and she said um you know check out we were, we were um, friends on be real and she said check my be real and she was out in like a t-shirt in like a couple weeks ago where there was snow and hail here so i'm wow i'm, I'm very uh, envious of, of your weather um but i, I want to talk about cpac but before i do i, I want to ask you if you got a chance to see tucker carlson's um uh, how do I even say it? Lies, distortion, propaganda from last night um, about what happened on January 6th. And if so, what do you think we should make of it? I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I I, I just, I, I, I don't know what the point of watching something like that is yeah. it, other than for the clear, you know, clownishness of it. I mean, I, I don't know. There was no, there was nothing newsworthy or noteworthy in it. It was all propaganda. Uh, he's honing his, um, you know, his uh, you know, sort of author author authoritarian uh, tarian sort of skill set. I guess yeah. I don't I don't know I don't I didn't pay much attention to it because I just think you know the fact that uh, McCarthy gave all of this uh, to just one individual, not a reporter, yeah. not yeah. a journalist, but a hype man for Putinism. Um, no matter what he puts out, whenever he puts it out, what are we going to scream? It's a lie. I mean, of course we know yeah, it's a lie. It's yeah. 40,000 hours. He shows a five minute clip and you got people on the internet now screaming, see, I told you, I told yeah. you. I'm like, Would you sh just shut the hell up. Yeah. Shut up. So I, no, um, I, I did not uh, want to play in that reindeer game and, and watch Tucker do what Tucker does. Uh, he is, I mean, uh, he's a f sophisticated liar, um, propagandist, mm -hmm. uh, and Fox News and its board um, allows for him to do that every night, to go out and mm -hmm. deliberately lie to the American people, and they think that's okay. Mm -hmm. And I hope Dominion bankrupts them. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you about, so um, first of all, I, I th this morning, I didn't watch it last night, but I saw some clips this morning and Elon Musk now is talking about how the January 6th committee has misled the public. But I want to get into the Dominion. Elon Musk loss. is another one who needs to <laughs> shut yeah. the hell up. I'm exactly. sorry. Yeah. I mean, really, Elon, seriously? Oh, so now, like, oh, now, now January 6th got it wrong. And yeah. you have evidence of that because Tucker Carlson put something right. in front of you. You know, this sort of right wing bullshit to me is just absolutely uh, we just have to we have to as Americans got to get a grip on this thing and stop it because the end game is not good. But anyway, yeah. you were going to make a point. Uh, I mean, you're you're a lawyer and, and you went to law school. I, I'm wondering what you make of this Dominion lawsuit and, and just how bad it is for Fox News. There's one point six billion dollars in um in defamation um fines and, and I'm I'm wondering what you think of that and whether or not you think that can spell the end of maybe not Fox News entirely, but maybe just putting an end to the lies that they Go it, on air. It won't spend the, uh, uh, you know, spell the end of it. Um, 
it will make it will make a dent in it. I mean, but Fox News is still generating income. Yeah. You know, advertisers aren't pulling out of out of yeah. Fox mm-hmm. uh, orbit or not putting their products on their air. Um, and that's the bottom line. I mean, hell, yeah. if I'm doing a bad thing and everyone keeps coming to my store or keep coming to me and supporting me, why would I stop doing a bad thing? Because yeah. I'm still getting paid to do a bad thing. Um, and until the, you know, advertisers um, stop being complicit with their dollars uh, because they're more interested in selling their product to a, a hyper, uh, you know, evangelized community of, of anti-democratic Americans. Uh, you know, I don't know what else what else we're going to do. I mean, we, how, do we just let this thing play out and and just hope to heaven that it just kind of runs its course and then you know you know like the song tomorrow you know <laughs> tomorrow tomorrow would be a better yeah. day what you know you know it you know yes it's a day away but that day is as dark as today yeah and and so when do we step into our responsibility as citizens? And say this is not what we want to be, and for those of you who want this type of America, then leave because that's not the America we're going to give you. Yeah. Well, but- on that dark note, um, I, I want to ask you about this year's CPAC conference, um, and, and I want to give our audience, especially maybe those younger um, listeners and, and watchers who may only see CPAC through the lens of Trump, what it once stood for, and, and can you walk us through? what CPAC once represented in the Republican Party when, say, you were the chair, and and if we ever saw what we're seeing now? So CPAC was, has always been an organ for younger, more libertarian-oriented Republicans, all right? And those Republicans who really um, adhere to one of the core... um, values of republicanism which was individual liberties and rights so they were very much of a mind around you know the less government interference in the decisions that victor she would make about who he's going to love and where he's going to live and how he's going to raise his kids and all of that would be left to victor the government has no role there um and the community in which you decide to live presumably y'all kind of work it out right mm-hmm. and so you make those decisions at the local level um from school board to you know uh public safety to all kinds of things yeah. that the community that you live in which presumably kind of reflects some of your values right um uh decide how you want to live so there was this 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 day where um, it was a gathering of a lot of those types of con- young conservatives, um, and it was a great way for um, establishment politicians who want to be president mm-hmm. uh, to sort of roll through, give you know a great speech, and and you know sort of win the day, um, and and try to make make inroads as they began to set up a presidential run. Um, and in the course of that, you know, the the attendees would decide, oh, who we like. And and typically, you know, uh, Ron Paul was a perennial favorite for a lot of the delegates who attended because, again, it was much more of a libertarian bet to it. Donald Trump's first appearance at CPAC was not a, a winning appearance. Um, and I think it was uh, early in 13 or 14 um, and he'd gone through, um, and but it does speak to his ability to completely change the trajectory of this organization to the point right, now right. that no one wants to go to it. Yeah, yeah. and we saw <laughs> that with the crowd size, exactly. small right. crowd I mean, size. It just, just pathetic crowd size. It does not help that the uh, the head of the organization, Matt Schlapp, has yeah. been accused yeah. of pummeling a man's junk. Um, uh, while he was being driven to the airport or a hotel. I don't even know how that narrative plays out because <laughs> yeah. they're all such good Christians. Um, I'm tr- I went to my Bible immediately and tried to figure out where Christ was talking about pummeling someone's uh, private parts, but I couldn't find it. 
um, where he said that was okay, but mm-hmm. they'll work that out, right? Um, and and so now it's become a, a sh- not even a, a not even a, a respectable shadow of itself of his former self. It is a national joke. Yeah. Um, and I think this year the attendance, the response, the lack of enthusiasm really reflected that. The fact that nobody of any political reputation was there, from the speaker mm-hmm. to the. Um, uh, majority leader in the Senate, I mean, minority leader in the Senate yeah. to um, former electeds uh, who are considering a presidential run. So, Victor, it's, it, is, it is a wasteland of political grifters yeah. and liars, uh, deniers, election deniers, um, Putinist um, people who support uh, Bolsonaro and um, um, Orban. Yeah. Um, they, in my view, crap on the Re- on the legacy of Reagan and and Bush, uh, forty one, um, Eisenhower, uh, men uh, and some women who have led the party in a way uh, that is no longer reflected by yeah. the gathering there uh, at CPAC. Do you think so? You mentioned the the pathetic crowd size and and the low enthusiasm. Do you think that's an an indicate or a good indication of where the Republican Party is going? Is, is does that give you optimism? <laughs> that's an interesting way to put the question. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't because it just means probably something. You know, folks had something else to do. It doesn't mean that they're less MAGA. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean that they're less radicalized towards anti-democratic behavior. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that should a call come for another January sixth that they won't show up on mass. So people need to step back and stop, you know, projecting that. Oh well, this means this. This it doesn't mean jack. Yeah, All it means yeah. is that for this gathering, probably uh, due to a confluence of a lot of circumstances from match slap to, <laughs> yeah. you know, I got something to do on Saturday night, people didn't show up. Um, I would not bank on that as a show of a lack of enthusiasm. Why? Mm-hmm. Because Donald Trump is leading in every poll. Yeah. And not yeah. just leading, but his, his poll numbers are, are riding. And I said this in the fall when people are all hyped up about Donald Trump not, you know, performing well or not doing this. And and then when DeSantis came on, oh, the great, the great white hope um, of Ron DeSantis coming in to save, you know, the right white people, I guess. I have no idea what his story is. Um, I do, but we'll get into that maybe later. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, y'all need to just take the stupid cap off because Ron DeSantis a, has a glass jaw. He's never been hit. And folks, it's not Michael Steele saying that. <laughs> Honest to God, ask yourself, how do you lose a, a gubernatorial debate to Charlie Crist? <laughs> yeah, that and, is and true. And that's no fight on Charlie Crist. Yeah. But if you're all that in a bag of, you know, hot Doritos, then you take him out. But you go right. watch that right. debate for, for the governor's race uh, back in, I think it was October of last year. And you, and you just see how how weak he is in the jaw, how weak he is politically. Um, he will not translate outside of Florida. I still hold that until proven otherwise. Mm, so right. I was just telling people, Victor, look, Donald Trump hasn't engaged anybody yet. Donald, yeah. All Donald Trump did was announce he's running for president. Barely. And, right. he, and he's, he, hasn't, he hasn't come out here, you know, putting on the big town hall rallies. I mean, please don't take CPAC as a gauge of a lack of enthusiasm and support for Donald Trump because mm-hmm. <laughs> you are going to be going down a wrong road. This man ha- not only has staying power, he has growing power. Yeah. There are a lot more vi- uh, Americans out there, Victor, and you and I have talked about this. Yeah. There are a lot more Americans out there who support Donald Trump and probably don't have a problem with him being the next president of the United States, then we are willing to admit. Wow. Uh, that That's horrifying. And, and uh, one of the reasons why I admire you, Michael, is because, you know, we disagree po- on policies, I'm sure, but you aren't afraid to call out this Republican Party and Trump. And, and in this moment, I'm wondering what message you have for traditional Republicans, traditional conservatives who aren't speaking out and and maybe why they aren't speaking out. What, what, what I, would you tell I, them? I appreciate that question. And I'm actually glad you asked. I, you know, I 
I've been thinking a lot on this in recent months, particularly as I watched Kevin McCarthy turn, you know, take all the power of his leadership and give it to some some bat brained uh, yeah. congresswoman from Georgia who doesn't know her head from a hole in the wall um, and goes out and pronounces, oh, we should succeed. You know, the country needs to be divided into red and blue states. I'm like, hey, dumbass, you're in a blue state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it just I'm sorry. It just it just so aggravates me. Um, yeah. And what I find so distressing on that propels that aggravation to new levels is that there are a lot more Republicans out there who think like I do and feel like I do about the party. I haven't given up the part on the party, which is why I haven't left. Yeah. Because I still believe it, there are the, the the founding ideals of our party still should resonate, and, and if you find the right messengers and you find the right vehicles in order to convey that message, that reasserts uh, Madisonian democracy, uh, Madisonian principles around governing, uh, the ideas that were. Um, that you and I could go back to debating whether or not, you know, trickle down economics works or whether or not we should have national health care. All those things are good, healthy debates for a thriving republic to have. But we can't have those debates. We can't have that conversation because of the numb nuts in Washington who yeah, can't yeah. find a pair among them to just stand up and look at someone like Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Gosar, and others and say, shut the hell up, sit down. This is not America. This is not America with a K, right. all right? right. Um, and so it's really dis distressing. So I would say to them, find that inner strength to be willing to sacrifice something for the country, right? Yeah. Look, I know I've made so many political enemies over the last six years. I mean, people that were besties with me won't even return a phone call wow. you know well i can't you know i get so i and think about living in washington victor <laughs> is that everybody talks to everybody i right. was born and raised here so i know pretty much everybody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not hard right so word gets back i know who's running their mouths and that's fine i don't care because what the the bigger and most important thing for me is being able to to pass on a country that people want to live in, pass on a country yeah. that people can thrive in, pass on a country that can remain a, a symbol of democracy to the world where people want to come to this and, and be a part of this experiment where their, their cultural and uh, family legacy can be wrapped into the red, white, and blue of America um, that to me should be what this is about. I don't want to turn people away. I don't want to, you know, go after a, a 15 year old kid who's trying to discover their sexuality. I don't want to tell an eight year old, you can't read, you know, Huckleberry Finn, or you can't read, you know, uh, the, the writings of a modern day author who's trying to contextualize American history for you so that you have a better appreciation of why we're such a good country, why this system works. But so that's where I am. And I'm hoping more people yeah. will find the, the, the reserve, the, the nerve, the resolve, whatever to, to, to join in that fight. I hope so too. And Michael, we're gonna I'm gonna have to have you back on because this was such a phenomenal conversation. And uh, I have so many more questions to ask you, but because the format of the show is quick, um, I think that's the perfect place to end. Hopefully Republicans will grow a spine and stand up to to what's happening right now. But I'm I'm grateful for your voice and um thank you for all that you do. I appreciate you, my friend. I'll see you back here in DC, babe. Thanks so much. Bye, Michael. All right, take care. Interesting episode with Michael Steele. Michael Steele is someone who, um, like I said during the episode, I know a lot of people might have policy disagreements with Michael and other Republicans who are speaking out. But in this moment, I think it requires as many Michael Steeles as possible to speak out against this Republican Party, which, like he said, is more Putin, more authoritarianist, more um, fascist than ever before. And it really takes all of us to use our voice and our platform for the better. Um, a couple of things before I let you all go uh, for the day. First of all, yesterday there was some good news regarding John Fetterman. His chief of staff, Adam Gentleson, uh, posted a photo of him and John Fetterman in uh, the hospital that he's being treated in, and they are hard at work, and he said that he is on his way to a 
speedy recovery and um, everything is going well and they're still doing the work of Pennsylvania and, and reviewing bills and making sure that he represents his constituents. So we're, we're seeing some good good signs there. And, you know, it was just, again, really sickening to see uh, Republicans tell, uh, you know, John Federer that what he, you know, attacking him for simply getting treatment. Uh, what he did, I think, is so important, so critical in this moment, especially when mental health is so stigmatized, I think, a lot of the times. For someone like John Fetterman, someone who has power, someone who is in a position of power, I think what John Fetterman did is quite remarkable. And seeing this transparency, seeing you know photos of him with his chief of staff still working, even despite um, being treated, I think is really inspiring and I think does a, a long way. So um, all of our thoughts and prayers go out to John Fetterman and, and, and his uh, speedy recovery because we need him. And um, I, I think he's doing a great public service right now. Um, one other thing that I saw, or a couple other things I saw yesterday that were uh, pretty striking to me. First, um, some good news out of California. Um, I don't want to say my governor because technically I don't live in California permanently and I don't vote here, but I'm technically here for school at UCLA. And Governor Newsom has announced he is seizing all business ties with Walgreens because of what Walgreens did in terms of banning uh, abortion pills in 20 states where abortion is legal. Um, so so Governor Newsom has made that, I think, really remarkable decision. It takes a lot of guts to do that, I think, especially when it's as big as Walgreens. Um, so good news there. And I think uh, just a really t testament to his leadership. And, you know, for me, I hope that other Democratic states do the same thing. You know, I'm from Illinois originally. I hope J.B. Pritzker from Illinois does the same thing, sends a message that what Walgreens is doing is really the not, not the right move. You know, it's not even in legal states. It's in legal states where abortion, you can access abortion. And so um, it's just to me all around. Um, grotesque what Walgreens did, and I think a good sign. And I hope um, uh, more governors follow uh, um, Governor Newsom's footsteps. One other thing is that Mike Pence yesterday has um, asked a judge to uh, block his subpoena uh, to testify in front of a grand jury regarding his role on January 6th. Remember, Trump wanted him not to do so. Uh, Pence has resisted the subpoena. He thought that it would be more convenient to write a book and tell his story that way. And my question is, you know, what does he have to hide? I mean, this is someone who is delayed, delayed, delayed. Is it he's scared of Donald Trump? Is it he has something to hide? Is it both? I, you know, it, it's just strange to me how he's so comfortable writing a book, but he doesn't feel comfortable testifying in front of a grand jury and, and about his role in January 6th. So it's confusing to me. I, I think there's something more to this that we don't quite know. And, um, you know, my my I know this for sure, though, which is Jack Smith, uh, no matter what Mike Pence does, he can outsmart and outmaneuver Mike Pence any day of the week. I would not test Jack Smith. So um, we'll see what happens. But Mike Pence has done the unsurprising move, but again, the uncourageous move. We, we knew that, you know, he did the one maybe right thing during the uh, Trump presidency. But as we're seeing now, this man doesn't have a spine uh, and can't uh, just do what the American people expect of him, which is to testify and, and tell tell you know prosecutors what he saw that day but you know he can't so uh, i wonder why um that's all the news that i have for you today and we'll be back tomorrow with more uh content uh tomorrow we'll be joined by wajaha ali who i'm sure all of you have if you watch the mary trump show wajaha is a very very good voice we'll be talking about nikki haley and how as an indian american why what she's saying about america is so misguided and also kind of dangerous and then on thursday we're gonna be talking to representative or not representative senator malcolm kenyatta from pennsylvania who will talk about the importance of state legislatures why pennsylvania is a key state and what we can do to uh really promote the importance of down ballot races malcolm kenyatta will be on thursday and then on friday we're gonna have on representative barbara lee last week we had adam schiff this week we're gonna have on barbara lee to talk about her race in the u.s senate race for california California. You don't want to miss that. So again, every day right here on youtube.com slash Politicon at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time right here on uh, youtube.com slash Politicon. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode and feel free to share these episodes with anyone in your life who is young or anyone who wants to learn more about the news of the day. Uh, we'll be here every day, every weekday. Um, and I am grateful for all of you for tuning in uh, today and watching this episode with Michael Steele. And I will see you all tomorrow. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Bye-bye.